Ruby. Hi, I'm Stephanie McCabe with Mark McCabe of Training Between the Ears and Kate Walker of um, The Incredible Canine. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about a concept called mouse traps. And Kate has a specific question for Mark about a mouse trap situation. And Mark will talk a bit about it. So I have a client uh, who owns a dog, of course and had a guest that came over to the house. And when the guest came over to the house, uh, the guest was taking off his shoes, the dog was smelling the guest, and the guest uh, like made noises, like a barking noise at the dog. And the dog peed himself. So fast forward to the next day, there was another guest that came into the house, and the dog peed himself a total of four times during that visit of the guest. On contact with the guest? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the guests pet the dog. So he's going up to them, but then when they reach to him, he's peeing. He peed. Yeah. Yep. And the owner uh, had the idea to give the food to the guest to give to the dog. And I just knew that in TVTE, we don't give food to the guests. We are only delivering food, but I just wanted uh, an explanation or a thorough mm -hmm. like, description of why we wouldn't do that. Okay. Cool. So first thing that this brings up that's important that will make sense to people who've been to TBT workshops, maybe not to people if they're hearing just this, but this is why we talk about the behavioral spectrum and the similarity between the bold, aggressive dogs and the weak, shy, nervous dogs. Um, and I know this dog a little bit, and he doesn't hardcore fit into either category. He does some of both, but some dogs are very much one or very much the other. And people see no similarity in training those dogs. Because they think, oh, well, this one's way over at this end of the spectrum, so you treat him one way, and this one's way over at this end of the spectrum, and you treat him another way. Um, and in the next page on the manual, we show, instead of that line, a circle where the bold, assertive dog actually is right next to uh, the shy, nervous dog. And uh, this is a good example of why we show that and talk about it. And so I would treat this dog's nervous or anxious behavior in that case, and he's clearly not afraid of people, he's going up to them all the mm -hmm. time, but he also clearly is stressed by it in some way, or even end up being. I would treat that exactly the same as if that dog would bite under that stress. And if he would bite under that stress, then we would be very inclined to use a boundary. Say, you can't just go up to these people and experience that level of stress because your response to that stress might be that you would bite. In this case, his response to stress is that he's peeing, mm -hmm. but I would, respond, I would deal with it, think about it exactly the same. Either way, we're trying to get the animal to not be stressed. And in the case of the bold, aggressive dog, we'll be using the boundary to prevent a bite from happening. In the case of this dog, we'd be using the boundary to prevent the initial stress that causes the pee and using rewards and differential reinforcement for relaxation to help the dog get less stressed so that hopefully, maybe just two minutes later or ten minutes later, if the people petted the dog, we wouldn't get that stress response of the pee. So that's the first thing to understand that I would view it exactly the same as a dog that was biting both as far as why that would make me want to have boundaries and everything I would do to help the dog feel well. Um, so in this case, the owner is kind of acting on that way of thinking by deciding that, okay, I should have the people give the dog food to make it feel more comfortable and reduce its stress. So <clears throat> in giving the food, we're trying to create what we call an appetite of response. Oh, hey, you have food. I like you. I feel good. And with the idea being that if the dog felt really well about the person, then it wouldn't get stressed when they pet it or do something stupid playfully with it or whatever. And um, so then, therefore we wouldn't have the peeing response. And, and I would mention in TBT we care more about the stress than we do the peeing. 
in the sense that the peeing is the symptom of the stress, and we're really concerned about the stress and helping the dog get beyond that. Some people might decide the peeing doesn't create a people problem. Let's just say they, somebody might say, well, I only have him greet people outside, so it doesn't matter when he does it. Well, no, it still matters because he's still stressed. Mm -hmm. The peeing just tells us that he is. That's what we want to come over. And in fact, you've mentioned this dog will go up to greet other dogs in a way that seems mostly pretty good, but his hackles are up. Mm -hmm. Exact same thing. It's just a stress response. Mm -hmm. And I had said before, I wouldn't let him greet the other dog until his hackles were not up. Mm -hmm. So, again, exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> if a dog were in a purely appetitive state, if he just felt good about things, it would not be possible for the person petting the dog to induce the stress that leads to the peeing. So we'd like to use the food rewards to help the dog get to that appetitive state. If the dog were purely in the opposite, what we would call an aversive state, where it's afraid of something, or it's uncomfortable with something, or it wants to make something go away, um, then we'd definitely get the peeing. We'd get it every time. If it always was in a complete aversive state when it met new people, we'd get that, or it would run away, or whatever else. And so people very commonly think about using food to help the dogs become more comfortable, but they tend to attach the food to the person that they're trying to make the dog more comfortable with. And the idea is, is that association. If this person gives me food, well then I must feel comfortable with them. And there's a potential really big problem with that, and we'll see this problem play out through what we call a mixed state. So a dog that's partly appetitive, but it's partly aversive. And this dog obviously was in that state. Mm -hmm. He went up to the people on his own, so he's not in a completely aversive state. Mm -hmm. He's sniffing them, he's checking them out, but he's in a partly aversive state because he's stressed out enough by the person reaching the pet him or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when we try to have the people hand the dog the food, we're not actually rewarding the dog for specific behavior as we as trainers might. It's just this very loose general thing. Here, I have food, you should feel comfortable with me. And it's extremely common that the dogs end up in a mixed state. And it's actually really obvious to see in a lot of dogs. You see a lot of dogs that end up stretching out for the food. Their back end is like as far away as they can be. They're all stretched out. They're ready like, if you blink wrong, I'm going to be out of here. But the, so that's the, ap the aversive part. You know, they're all stretched out trying to be away. Obviously, they're appetitive enough to try and get the food. And the image that I use for this is what I call mouse trap syndrome. The mouse wants the cheese out of the trap, but he doesn't learn to love the trap. He's like, hey, the trap's still not a good thing. The cheese is a good thing, but it never makes me think, oh, wow, you know, I should just go over and do a dance on this thing. And the experience Stephanie and I have had many times, we have a farmhouse, and a couple times a year we get families of mice move in, and we go put mouse traps around. And... Um, you know, they all have cheese or peanut butter in them or whatever. And the first, oh, I don't know, week to ten days, you know, you're clack, 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 you're just killing mice left and right. About ten days into it, you start coming across mouse traps that have no more cheese in them. But there's no mouse in it either. So some mouse has learned how to come get the cheese out of that trap without getting killed by it. But I guarantee you, if you watch that mouse, they are very, very careful about how they're getting out of that. If they didn't perceive the trap as dangerous, they'd get killed. They'd just come up and get the food out of it the way every other mouse did. So they're getting food out of the traps, but it doesn't mean they feel comfortable about the trap. They're like, well, that thing's dangerous. And this is the way dogs often behave in taking the food from the people. They're in this mixed state, and they're like, well, I want your food, but I don't feel completely comfortable about it. So what we would do instead in TBTE is we would take the food away from the stranger. First of all, the stranger isn't a trainer. They don't know how to look for specific behavioral responses that we would want to reinforce. They're just generally going to give food. The other thing that's really important and worth mentioning about in this is when you give the people the food, they now feel empowered to pet the dog, hug the dog, do whatever else. Because I gave it food, it took the food. Well, we're good friends now. you know. And that's a little bit like you and I go to a movie together because we have the same interest in this documentary and I think, well, she must want me to kiss her. There might not be any connection between those two things whatsoever. No, I wanted to go to a movie. 
But people have that kind of dating mentality about, like the dog taking the food. Oh, you took food from me now, sort of friends. So it tends to empower people to then do more. What we really want to do is we want to support the dog in what we call pro-social behavior. Going and investigating the person and checking them out. But as closely as possible, we would like the dog to be in a purely appetitive state. So, if the person doesn't have any food, the dog is only going to go up to the person for their own reasons, their own curiosity and whatnot. And now what we can do is we can terminally bridge and reward the dog for any interaction that we think is good. And we could be doing that not just because the dog didn't do anything bad, but to make the dog feel more secure about this. And we can also use the food to interrupt the social flow of behavior. So, like undoubtedly what happened with this dog is, initially he goes up and sniffs, he's not peeing. He's like, oh, this is all good. It's only at the point at which the person reaches to touch him, now he pees. Well, if when he went up and did the sniffing, we terminally bridged, said yes, and threw the food at the dog or a little bit away from the dog, that would tend to induce turning from the dog to go get the food. And now it would have broken the flow of that social interaction at the point that it was really successful. So we would have taken one little chunk of that interaction and said, hey, you just did that awesome, and nothing bad happened. And then we could leave the dog to experiment some more if we thought that might be constructive, or we could take the dog away. We might just say, hey, that's, that's great, that's as much as that dog needs to do, we'll get out of here. Or we can let him do more. He might repeat a very similar action, and we might decide, okay, repeating just that step is great. We want to show them every time you do this, this works out great. Or we might think, okay, I don't want to terminally bridge right now. I want to let the dog experiment a little bit more. And maybe the dog does a little bit more. He pushes in a little bit more. He solicits petting or something. And in this case, let's say the person actually reaches out to pet. Well, in the moment they're reaching out to pet, we might say yes and throw the dog food and break the interaction again before he gets to the point that he pees. The person, the, the guest who came in, would never know to do all that stuff and would never know how. And they would draw the dog beyond its grade school level. Because they have the food, the dog will come in and do behavior that it wouldn't be comfortable doing on its own. So by us taking the food away from them, we don't have this mouse trap syndrome where the dog is being drawn into something it's not really comfortable for. And we actually have the experienced, knowledgeable person guiding the interaction. And we use the food to break the interaction and reward it, rather than what would happen if that person gave the food, it would draw the dog further in. So, it's all about the mouse trap syndrome. Get away from that, and in this case, you be in the driver's seat, and you control the whole thing, as opposed to handing a piece of food to, knows, to somebody who knows nothing about your training and what you're trying to do. Is that better? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Any thoughts? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's all, folks. That's right. <laughs>